Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of I'm Hot and Smart. How does she do it? We don't know. It's probably AI. This is a deep fake. It's a deep fake of Tom Cruise. Okay, you girls want to learn and I know you want to learn, but you just don't know how and you get bored because TikTok has ruined our attention span. And I think that as humans, we love to be fed information through the lens of don't you want to know? Did you know? And yeah, I'm gonna fall for it every time. So that's kind of what I want to channel here with you guys today is I want to tap into that morbid curiosity with something I've been hyper fixating on lately because when I like something, you guys have to like something. You get it? We have to talk about my hair because it looks great. Thank you guys for saying it. I have been hyper fixated on World War One. I. I watched this BBC special called World on Fire because you guessed it, you and Mitchell was in it. Hi. Hey, made me cry. Like objectively a great TV show. I really wanna talk about specifically World War One's effect on art and what was art before the war and how did it deeply and psychologically affect an entire generation of people. Yeah, I think that propaganda is such an interesting thing. And I was a communication major in college and we studied a lot of propaganda and useful and successful rhetoric techniques. How do you incite a war and how do you incite uh, support and success by using words? You know, cause at this time you couldn't just, Ew, I was about to say something so millennial. At this time you couldn't just send out a tweet but it's true, you had to have in-person revolutionary meetings to spread ideas, very grassroots. So let's get into it, guys. So sit down, buckle up, we're going to school and you can't leave because guess what? I'm the teacher, I've locked all the doors and you gotta take notes because there's a test at the end. Here we go. This is the dark history of propaganda and World War I's impact on art. Ah! A video essay by me, Brittany Broski. So from the thumbnail, of course you've seen these paintings and these posters, right? But what do they mean? Where do they come from? It's a very simple message, but a heavy one. I'll be focusing on primarily the British and American perspective of World War I. I would also like to provide a content warning. If gore or death or any of the horrors affiliated with war is enough to kind of make you queasy, maybe skip out on this one, all right? Or skip forward to the very end. So give me that watch time. <laughs> Broski Nation, give me something, guys. <laughs> and as always, when I do these art videos, if you are thinking of using this as a citation or a source in any academic work you are working on, don't. <laughs> don't use me as a citation on your essay, okay? So. Let's jump into it. The contextual history of World War I's impact on art history. So think about it. It's turn of the century, all right? Stanley, put some ragtime music. It's turn of the century, okay? It's 1914. Industrialization, women's suffrage, technological innovations for both civilian and military use. We're talking radios, cars, planes, cinemas assembly lines, but adversely, we now have the introduction of machine guns, tanks, aerial bombs, things that we've never really experimented with before in quite a way as what was to come. Coupled with all of this is the steady and slow rise of German militarism, which will be a common theme throughout this entire video. So politically, what's going on? This is crash course European history, but for idiots. Okay guys, Broski Nation, stick with me guys, take notes. It's 1914, you've got Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. Austria-Hungary is part of the Germanic or German empire. Austria wants to crush Serbia's independence because Serbia is seen as a threat to the expansion of the German empire. Tensions come to a head when the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. It was done as an act of terrorism by a, a Serbian assassin and thus this started this inevitable sort of, you know, snowball effect of declaration of war. Germany gives an ultimatum to Serbia and Russia. They say, you can back down or we're gonna declare war on you. And Serbia and Russia say, mm, I don't really feel like it. Thus, Germany declares war on Russia and Serbia and France by affiliation because Russia and France are Allied. So now Germany's heating up. We're in full blown war mode, okay? They want to attack France, but the Western Front is way too like well prepared. So the attack plan is to go through Belgium, okay? To get into France and invade France. Well, guess what guys? Belgium and the UK, 
besties. So the minute that Germany starts pillaging and kind of making their way through Belgium, the UK is immediately involved. Thus begins World War One. So British troops come down to join French troops to defend the Western Front. And this really came to a head in 1916 at the famous Battle of the Somme. This Battle of the Somme was so devastating. This, this introduction of trench warfare to both sides and a devastation and brutality that we have never seen. At this one specific battle, Allied casualties totaled over a million. This was a motivating factor for a lot of servicemen to join up. And it was this fervent nationalism of like, defend your country, like patriotism, like fuck all this going on. Like we have to kill the Germans. We have to fight the Germans. And this influenced a lot of people to sign up. But once you're out there and you lied on your application to join, you're 16, 17 years old. Your life hasn't even begun. And you're at the Battle of the Somme? You're the Battle of the Somme? The servicemen on both sides struggled to see a purpose, right? When you're out there and nationalism is pretty much all you got, it's like, well, damn, do I even like Great Britain that much? Damn. There was nothing heroic or glamorous about this war. It was arguably incredibly unnecessary, incredibly preventable. It was grotesque. It was just by all accounts tragic. It was just a tragedy. Like I said, it was young men scrambling to join up, lying about their age, being encouraged by the government to lie about their age because they needed young and able-bodied men to come fight this war. Also at this time, we see an outbreak of disease, Spanish influenza, hits around 1918. That coupled with permanent long-term effects of trench warfare, if you have the stomach for it, Google trench foot. Hey, huh? you are constantly wet. It's just like a fun little breeding ground for infection. <laughs> so like I said at the beginning of the video, this was a 20th century war being fought with new technology, but 19th century tactics. Technology like airplanes, chemical and gas warfare, tanks, the Gatlin gun, machine guns. This was a level of rapid death that we have never up until this point seen. What's the fucking point of all of this? What's the, what are we even fighting for? And so these sentiments that were brewing, you know, both people at home and in the trenches on the battleground, this led to a general sense of disappointment and cynicism and pointlessness, which will later be reflected in the art that is to come out of World War I. So this cynicism and disillusionment really defined this literary and artistic period of the 20s, what would come to be the 20s. Let's focus on how all of this, all of that backstory, how did that influence art, right? Because art history is, I think, checking the pulse of humanity in a certain historical period. It's checking the pulse of mentally where people were at, new creative ideas they were exploring, new beliefs, new movements, music, literature, art, that is humanity at its core and historical events, battles, wars, all of that is so external. So all these external factors that are bleeding into the inside, brewing and, and coddling this fire of just cynicism, it was sardonic and it was satirical and it was just so trying to make sense of this unnecessary, absurd war. So keep that in mind with all of these works that I'm gonna go through. So leading up to the First World War, um, I want to give you a little art history timeline. Where were we before? What's going on here and what was to come after? So the turn of the century into like 1900, we're looking at realism, accurately depicting life as you see it. And as art history movements go, I would say usually each one is a an adverse reaction to the previous one. So it'll usually be either, you know, you're building off of the previous one a little bit, or it'll be the absolute antithesis of what it was before. So if we have realism, next up comes impressionism and romanticism, which impressionism is what it sounds like. You're trying to paint an impression of what you're seeing. So think Starry Night by Van Gogh, right? Very impressionistic. That is by no means an accurate depiction of what that sky looked like. So that's kind of where we're going, right? We're, we're abandoning this idea of concrete realism. So then we go a little further. Expressionism comes next. Expressionism and cubism and futurism and Russian avant-garde, all of these different movements have to do with reducing figures and scenes down to their absolute basic elements, okay? Colors, shapes. It's really what we're working with. And then it's this full-blown death spiral into just cynicism and like I said, satire. The only way we can really make sense of this is we have to make fun of it, right? We gotta like laugh our way through it. <laughs> 
So thus we land on abstractionism, Dadaism, and surrealism, which I'm sure you've heard of the very last one. The common theme that unites all of these, which is gonna be kind of the rest of what I talk about is the triumph of nonsense, okay? The failure of logic and rationalism because that's what this war was. It was a complete rejection of logic and rationalism. There is no way to justify and rationalize through death on that scale for no reason. So all of this abstractionism, surrealism, this is symbolic to represent war's destruction and horrors, to represent the overwhelming noise and stimulation of war, the smell of rotting corpses and cigarette ash, the taste of moldy biscuits when you're in the trench, the feel of soggy fucking boots that you've had on your feet for three weeks. That's what these artists are trying to convey. It's not so much about this is how the light looked or this is how this is an impression of what I saw. It's the feeling, the fucking feeling of being there. Okay? So there's two sides that I really want to highlight here. Pro-war, anti-war, direct propaganda, indirect propaganda. And they go together. So the moment you've all been waiting for, let's start with them. Sammy boy, unk, okay? Uncle Sam. This is direct pro-war propaganda. The official name of this piece is I Want You for US Army nearest recruiting station. This is from 1917. 1917 is when Americans joined the war join the war effort. This is by James Montgomery Flagg. Everyone knows this, right? This is a staple in American culture. This is memed. This is incredibly famous, internationally famous. This is Uncle Sam pointing his finger at the viewer and urging young men to enlist in the war effort, right? But the question is, how do you get American people at home to give a shit about this distant overseas war, right? And the answer is you make the threat immediate and real. So the US government creates a committee for public information, a war propaganda committee where they hired Flag, who was the artist who was a commercial illustrator and the rest is kind of history. So this is the first, and I would argue probably most important one to come out of, you know, pro-war propaganda. The second one, and before I kind of get into that, I need you to understand that when you're dealing with political propaganda like this, the goal of course is nationalism, it's patriotism, it's to rally the people. But in doing that, to be successful at that, you have got to dehumanize the enemy. You have got to draw the line in the sand that is us versus them. A good tactic to dehumanize your enemy is to portray them as an animal. Any country's military propaganda, it's gonna involve an animal. So here it is, we've got Destroy This Mad Brute by H.R. Hops. This is again, 1917. So what are we looking at here? So this is a dribbling ape-like German who is wielding a club bearing the word culture, which is culture, and wearing a pickle hob military helmet uh, with the word militarism across the top. He's walking under the shore of America while holding a half-naked woman in his grasp. Possibly were to infer that that's Lady Liberty in his arms. Now this one was tea because this poster demonized Germany as the enemy. German Americans were a big percentage of the American population at this time. And so the US government was like, maybe cool it on the fucking mad brute shit. Cause the German American, we don't want them to feel, and then there's gonna be a, come on guys. Well, guess what? They didn't listen. And uh, it ended up being a real problem. You know, in German Americans, Germans who were living in America, red scare-esque behavior of, are you a spy? Are you a German spy? And so internally now, this is the FBI becomes involved involved in all of this, of they're trying to scout the German spies. And the US government passes the Espionage and Sedition Act, which basically approved a bunch of FBI agents to kind of go out into American society and, you know, report their findings. Now, who is a great community or group of people to target in this sentiment? Artists. Because of course, if you're anti-war or an artist, you could be considered a German sympathizer. Artists at the time were considered a potential threat to national security. So now we see this, this is, this is on the American side. Let's completely flip pages and let's go to anti-war indirect propaganda. So this is by John Singer Sargent, and this is called Gassed and it was from 1919. A sergeant was an American anti-war painter. He traveled to France with British surgeon and painter, Henry Tonks in 1918. And simply put, 
he painted what he saw and what a fucking sight. British soldiers on their way to a dressing station, which were hospital tents that they would set up on the battlegrounds where they'll be treated for mustard gas exposure. Everyone is blindfolded because the gas would burn the eyes, sometimes even permanently blind them. If you look over on the right side, there's a young man in a second line who's vomiting as they're walking. And over on the right side as well, you can see the tent ropes of this dressing station that are visible. And in the middle of the painting is a football match which is being played in the afternoon sun. I think it's such an impressive thing to convey of, first of all, all the bodies on the floor. You know, are these soldiers resting from this gas attack? Are they dead? You know, who, it's the blind leading the blind. Like what, it's just so much chaos and tragedy. And somehow he has managed to capture this incredible dichotomy of they are clinging to normalcy as hard as they can, but how can you cling to normalcy? How can you be fucking normal when this scenario is your reality? The whole painting is reminiscent of the yellow smoke and nature of the mustard gas. Okay, so this painting, right, you're looking at it. The size of this painting is the size of a movie screen. This shit is fucking huge. And that scares me. Maybe I have that fear of what's called megalophobia. When I see something big, I'm like, huh? It's just a painting. I think also immediately what comes to mind here is the blind leading the blind. Literally, they're blind. You had to wrap that around your, because uh, it was just, what a metaphor is that? The blind leading the blind. Unqualified soldiers who joined up, who are leading unqualified soldiers who lied about their age into this pointless, absurd war. For what? They don't benefit from it. In fact, they're treated like shit when they go back to the UK. And how do you keep, how do you maintain a certain level of patriotism? How do you not become resentful, right? This next one is by a German painter named Otto Dix, who is incredibly, incredibly important when we're talking about World War I and art. Otto Dix and Pablo Picasso were both very inspired by Goya. And I've actually done a video on Goya if you wanna go watch it. Very inspired by Goya's etchings and his black paintings and his nightmare paintings. And you can really see, which is cool, the direct influence that Goya had on Otto Dix and on Picasso. So let's look at this. This is called Shock Troops Advance Under Gas, 1924. This depicts German soldiers using gas masks, launching a mustard gas attack on British soldiers. Here, human beings become mechanical monsters. The gas mask isn't just a mask, it's a new face. It's a replacement of the human face for that of a robotic, inhumane monster who is capable of doing these war crimes, of, of committing these atrocities. What's the most terrifying about this piece to me is that they're looking right at you. The viewer of this painting is a victim, right? Like it's, it's supposed to instill that fear in you of being there. And I think that's what makes it so visceral. So Otto Dix was a German painter. He served in the war on the side of the Germans, obviously. He fought at the Somme, at the Battle of the Somme. He was pushed and pulled to the Western Front, the Eastern Front, and back again. He was injured, injured again, recovered, injured again, until finally the war was over and he was dismissed. When he got back to Germany, he was sickened by how ex-servicemen were treated even there as well. He became incredibly, incredibly anti-war once he returned home. He created perhaps the most powerful as well as most unpleasant anti-war statements in modern art. The quality of truth to the vulgar and psychologically wounding experiences he was painting, I think that's what set him apart from other war artists, right? It's this commitment to the truth telling of what the fuck was happening. And there's so many Otto Dix works I could go through, like all of them are just so viscerally impactful. So in the same vein of another anti-war indirect propaganda, right? Because how can you look at that and be like, oh, this is great. Oh, this is good. The next one I wanna talk about, which is the world famous Guernica by Pablo Picasso. This is from 1937. So this piece is super famous. You, you probably have seen it. It's about the German bombing of the small Spanish town of Guernica. This bombing was done for show. This was a small civilian community. And this painting, I think by nature of Picasso's style, but also just the subject matter and how he did it, it's mocking the war as just a meaningless, senseless act of violence. It's a slaughter. It's an irrecoverable trauma. 
Picasso is saying Western civilization is a joke. It is so hypocritical and you can only show this in paintings. You know, you can't fix it, especially an artist, you can't fix it. And so it's like, what do you do? That helplessness. It's this need, like art needs to do something about this dissolution of society and morality, but it can't. It's a painting. The effort is sort of wasted because if so, pieces like Guernica would end the war. It would stop the war, but it's not possible. But since it can't, the place and role of art in society had to be renegotiated, right? It had to be reconsidered. So from that, this movement sort of crescendos into postmodernism, which is a whole other video I could get into. And if you look at this close enough, you'll see that there are clear inspirations and influences taken from Goya's 3rd of May, 1808. So this next one is another German artist who after the war became anti-war. This is called Night by Max Beckmann from 1918. Max served in the German army. After serving, he painted embattled nightmares. The war had devastated his personal perspective as well as his country's perspective. And in Night, he portrays a horrific spectacle. It shows how war rips apart a family in the form of violent home invaders. Vicious raiders tear this family apart. On the left, three intruders string up Max. One of them seems to twist his arm out of socket. You can see the agony on his face and behind him is this dark figure who's pulling on the rope around his neck. His body is splayed open, his legs are spread, his limp hand is out open to the viewers and all these details reveal this powerless vulnerability. And notice the dark bottom of his bare foot on the left. Do you see that? Remember I said Google trench foot? Most of the night is beige in color. It gives the painting a reverb of shock and numbness, which is how most humans respond to an incredibly overwhelming and traumatizing situation or face drains of color, literally. So he contrasts that beigeness to these little flashes of red. So the red mixed with these sharp angles and obtrusive lines, it sets you on edge before the violent nature of what's actually happening in the painting even registers. So when you do, you know, your eyes focus and it's like, oh fuck, it's even that more fierce. I think these type of works really explore this idea of humanity being to its core monstrous and evil. And maybe not even because of the war, maybe because we're always like this. Why are we so cruel to each other? How can we do this to our fellow man? So through these that I've been showing you, it's definitely going more from cartoony to this one's a little more abstract. And this next one is, you see it start to completely unravel. This is Soldiers Playing Cards by Fernand Leisure from 1921. He was a French painter who served in the war. And this is the first piece he made after he's back from war, if that says anything. Notice the dismembered mechanization of these human bodies. Not even if you could call them human bodies. There's, it's soldiers playing cards. These are images of these soldiers at rest, seemingly, right? Sitting down to play a card game. But at the same time, it's indicative of how the war had this permanently damaging, breaking effect on the human psyche. And I think that he really in encapsulates that well here of these are broken people who are just trying to fit back into society. But how can you fit back in when you are shattered from the inside out? You know, with videos like this, it's always fun to pick a topic and to go through the paintings and kind of give the context. But I always feel this moral obligation at the end of one of these videos to say some big speech about how war is bad and don't do it, which, yeah, but it's also like through these artistic movements and these life altering global events, humanity is pushed to this brink of creation and of suffering and death. And how did these people live through this, you know? And how did they make it out on the other side? I think it just like after a video like this, I'm always just so impressed by the indomitable human spirit. It just like the resilience of man and how it is such a human thing to process an event like this, you turn to painting, you know, to really work through those emotions. I think it's just, it's such a beautiful and, and human thing that in order to process, we must create. And I, th I think it's, it's great. And it's, it's very inspiring. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for watching guys. And uh, if you like these type of videos, I've done a bunch more and I have a playlist on my channel called Art. And you can go check that out because Stanley edits the fuck out of these videos and he slays. Thanks for giving me your undivided attention. And if you clicked off of the video, you're dead to me. You're dead to me.
no rations. There are no war. When Broski Nation goes to war, you get z goose egg rations. You're going hungry, bitch, because you didn't watch this video. Okay. All right. Love you guys. Bye bye.